Shall we start? Yeah, I think we're live. Ready? Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this panel discussion. Um, it's been a great start of the day, in my opinion. I hope everybody is enjoying themselves. And this, uh, uh, this panel, especially uh, we, uh, with the data governance, um, we've had these uh, three uh, exciting presentations. Um, Enrique, um, letting us know how to breathe life into our ideas and a whole world of solutions and Viraj uh, on how to leverage the power of connected workflows when CD meets uh, the digital twin. Um, and we also had the privilege to watch Steve uh, talking on quality and asked a very interesting question. Uh, when using technology, um, do we tell our clients that our employees are AI assistants? Uh, so I would recommend everybody who didn't manage to, to check them out. But uh, for us here, we can begin now on this panel. And I would like to start with you, Viraj. Um, what are the common challenges that organizations face when they adopt CDEs? Right. So, yeah, when, when it comes to CDEs, uh, especially talking in the context of the AEC sector, there are so many different kinds of stakeholders and, uh, you know, each one of them do not necessarily have a choice when adopting a CD. In you know most projects, we see the client enforcing that you know this is going to be the common data environment of choice. So for a lot of stakeholders, what they really have to juggle with is working on different CDs for different projects. Uh, so that's you know one of the challenges when it comes to appointed parties per se. And when it comes to appointing parties like the project owners or the owner representatives, uh, we've seen that, you know, uh, they are really spoiled for choice. There are so many good solutions uh, out there uh, in the market. And generally, owners have to, uh, you know, implement a CD solution across the entire organization. They would like to keep it as uniform as possible and as uh, standard uh, as possible across their projects. Uh, so, you know, uh, gauging which solution would be right for them uh, is sometimes a challenge in the industry. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, there is also a good place for having some kind of standards if there could be just like we have uh, ISO 19650 standards. Uh, so if we could have certain, uh, you know, standards around the technology side as well around the CDE as a concept. Uh, although there are a few elements already there, be it around information containers, the way workflows are managed, but there's very little component from the technology side. Uh, maybe there is an aspect of having standardized APIs and, you know, so that information exchange uh, happens seamlessly and we don't end up with the same, uh, I would say, interoperability issues that we see in the model authoring, you know, side uh, of things where we have lot of interoperability challenges that the industry is still grappling with even after uh, so many years of these tools being around cds are like still a much more you know modern uh, modern way of working as compared to you know bim uh, bim modeling solutions or cad drafting solutions have been there for ages now uh, so i think we can set the context uh, and you know set the standards really well if we uh, start at the right time so yeah Thank you, Viraj. Actually, it was a very good elaboration on this topic. And um, I also liked in your presentation the way you defined CDE. So um, again, for those that uh, didn't manage your uh, your talk, I think actually this is a very interesting point. Uh, most of us that work in the industry, we have actually also uh, uh, experienced the same challenges that you are addressing. So thanks. And the uh, challenges, Enrique, um, are you ready? <laughs> what are yeah, the yeah. challenges? Yes, what challenges make AI integration complex in the AC companies instead of enabling a universal solution, for example? Yeah, you know, like like complementing within the CDE and the selection of the specific software of the way of working, it's very evolving depending on why. I mean, the the the, the size of the company of the size that the, the provider is going to be using because it depends on data privacy and as well within how they want to leverage their solutions. So 
it comes that it's not just about picking a software, but also like how is that going to integrate? How I'm going to make it so that it connects with some other things? And in these cases that we are getting into AI type of solutions, what it should happen is that within that one is like how we're going to evolve it so that if we're picking a CD and we are moving everything to standards so that they go into specific point, if we're not considering future ongoing efforts, it's going to become very complicated because in that case, it might be like, yeah, everything is working great. But then we want to add something that it becomes their own language model or a way of understanding. And therefore, it's not possible, right? And we need to make another change on something that became very structural from the beginning. I mean, even though most vendors or, or most of what it's been on that pattern, right? Like Because we don't want to be outside of, of what's happening. But interoperability will keep being an issue. And I will say that it depends on how fast solutions can be arising results. Great. Thank you, Enrique. But on all of this, um, on the speed, question of speed and everything, you were actually also touching this uh, in your presentation. Um, we have one complexity. And uh, I think you agree that uh, developing private AI models, um, yeah. how do we ensure um, the security of company data? Yeah, I mean, in that case, it depends on how, because also company will need to have additional infrastructure for that one if, if, it's, if it's gonna be hosted internally or private, because even though you uh, like, you get it to mount into a different, uh, with different provider, then you need to secure with them that you don't have privacy breaches. And as well as that one saying like, you don't know if technology is evolved enough for now to be an end product or if it's still on a development going. So you are with those two seats settings that might be a gap in between how information flow. Uh, yeah, I mean, you cannot know it completely at this point. You can be getting like your wins, but you don't know if, if you get at this point, the wins, will that affect the future wins or will that take you out of the picture? So, I mean, that those are concerns that are, are questioning about how do we implement it, how the companies that are using CDEs, if they go in construction, if they go in design, and as well, how the people is going to adopt them, because it's like, you don't know what's happening with your data or how that data is being curated so that it gives you a proper response. Thank you, Enrique. Yes. Um, there is actually one uh, viewer question, um, and it's for Viraj. And um, the question is uh, how CDEs work with BIM and uh, a small statement that Revit, Revit is a foundation file. It's from Shut Up. Uh, go on, Virat. Right. So, yeah, if I understand that question correctly, uh, we are talking about interface between, you know, the BIM models which are being created, let's say, in Revit and the common data environments which are being used as a platform for making sure that everyone is working on the most up-to-date set of information. So most uh, CDs nowadays do support, uh, you know, uh, BIM file formats either natively or through IFC, which is the common standard of exchange uh, for BIM file formats. So typically, uh, you know, the workflows that are, you know, popular, uh, at least till this point in time, revolve around people exchanging files. Uh, it's just that instead of exchanging files over emails, uh, common data environments enable you know a central source of the most latest versions of these files. So talking about Revit specifically, uh, the most rudimentary workflow would be to have people upload files uh, onto the CDE and then collaborate on them. Uh, going a step further, uh, there could also be a possibility of directly allowing the Revit user or the Revit person who is doing, preparing the model to sync their file or upload their file through Revit into the platform, into the CD. And uh, the third uh, you know, generation, I would say, which is starting to get popular is instead of talking of files, uh, talk about data exchange. Uh, so, uh, you know, Files are essentially made up of, you know, a lot of BIM model elements, if I have to give an example, and you may not always want to share the entire file. So in, like if it's an architectural model, you may just want to share the facade with maybe the facade contractor or supplier who's going to be working on the facade. Uh, so they maybe don't need the entire model. 
So rather than working on a file-based workflow, I think the industry is also gradually moving towards a more data-centric workflow, which is where, irrespective of where the BIM model data comes from, whether it's from Revit, whether it's from, you know, maybe MicroStation or Open Buildings or Tecla, from whichever authoring model, uh, it's important to be able to decouple the data uh, from the graphics and be able to share that in an incremental manner. Uh, I think there are some interesting uh, technologies, interesting startups in this sector also, which have started working on, you know, the Git for the AEC industry, similar to how software development works. So I think we'll be seeing a lot of interesting ways of uh, how BIM interfaces with CD in the near future as well. Thanks a lot, Viraj. Yeah. Um, so Enrique, um, I hope, uh, shut up. I hope that this was uh, this was the answer uh, to your question. And back to Enrique now. Um, so uh, AI assistants and chatbots, it's everywhere in the air. How can they be integrated um, into specific processes to en to enhance our design feasibility and development in our current operations? Yeah, from that one, you know, like I got it within what when, when I was looking at your presentation, getting it around it, getting on the transformation of education, how how that it can be on change management. And as well, I would say that it's not a matter of just doing the change in between what you do and then AI to do it, because what it might happen at the end within that one is that you're losing the quality as, as well as Steve was telling on their presentation. Exactly. That yeah, yeah. So, so everything comes together within that one, and you keep on reframing on the same type of logic, getting into the consequences. That it's not a matter just to change things; it's just to get it like how people getting adapted on their workflows, and within those workflows, using the assistant chatbots so that they can get it like my dictionary is growing, my know my knowledge on how do you perform is growing, and as well, if you are just starting using AI at the beginning, or you are like completely doing developments on BIM, creating like add-ins, doing like with the Dynamo, or you're working in different parts of the cycle. The best approach from that one is how did you get your automations or your algorithms to work around? And within that one to start training so that you can have some uh, like line-based solution working for, for, for creating the dictionary, right? Like uh, I, I will state from that one that if I already have it, a process for doing clashes, then what I can do is I, get it so that that becomes a chatbot or a dictionary, like a customer service. And then it keeps growing so that that growing data can tell me and can learn from my way of working that the next one that comes, it says like, oh, every time you're working for this type of process, you're doing A, B, C, D, and you're using these applications, these add-ins, or even though you're working just broad within the things you have in your model. And that way you keep on leveraging so that the people feel connected wherever they are doing. And as well, the way they are learning that things can get improved. So it's not just about automation happening, but how automation is getting somewhere so that it gets crafted as a knowledge base and then it keeps growing as an AI bot, a chatbot. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or, and actually, or even though with that one, are creating something, right? Like creating. Yeah. Sorry, you fell off. No, I, didn't, I, didn't... I thought you were finished. I'm sorry, Enrique. No, no, no it's not my friend. Yeah, sorry, just get it like. It was. I think it was the connection. Um, yes, exactly. Um, uh, so training is actually also a good aspect of this because, for example, uh, in the engineering uh, in consultancy where I work, we are training now chatbots into specific norms. And then predictivity for these norms will be also like, what are people wondering all the time about? Like what kind, which, uh, which aspects of these norms are actually rapidly used so that it could make these uh, uh, um, frequently asked questions for our business, for our projects. Interesting. And uh, yeah. I think uh, it would be a good idea to start um, a little bit of a wrap up. Uh, so Viraj, uh, for, this, for digital twins and implementation for the organizations, could you like uh, line up like two, three important aspects, the most important aspects? Right. So, uh, digital twins are something that a lot of organizations have started to talk about now. Uh, like I had mentioned in my presentation as well, it's not really a very new concept overall, but the AC industry is just starting to warm up to, uh, you know, uh, these things. Uh, 
uh, a very important aspect of when people hear about digital twins they immediately associate it to iot to you know sensor data that needs to be uh, coming in uh, to actually mimic the real world so uh, making sure that you have a good hardware solution uh, so that's also an important aspect if you are interested in like performance twin kind of a digital twin but you may not necessarily go to that level there are also various levels of uh, you know uh, digital twins that are there uh, just like we have uh, levels of uh, level of detail or level of development when we look at bim models so similarly you can have various uh, you know complexities in which uh, your digital twins can exist so just like with adopting any new technology i think one of the you know biggest recommendations i would have is to take one step at a time uh, instead of just getting too fascinated by what the end goal would look like uh, it it would be much more prudent to take smaller steps. Uh, most organizations already have the models. They have, you know, the uh, asset data that is being created in conventional ways. Start by first bridging that gap, how you can connect your BIM models, make sure that all the asset information is up to date at project handover. Your documents are interlinked uh, to the assets. And then, you know, take a step further uh, by maybe integrating facility management solutions and then looking at how we can make it into a real performance twin by integrating the hardware and sensor data. So I think that would be uh, one of my recommendations. Thank you again, Viraj. Yeah. And Enrique, also like for a wrap up, um, like if we're talking, if you talk about the three concerns in the AAC companies uh, for implementing AI, and one of them we already mentioned the quality right yeah what, what would you add to this uh three like or well i mean yeah i will always say at this point what, what is, has come to it is like data quality as a first one like well, where do you get your data and how is it fit so that in that case you are talking about the things you're like, trying to look for the other one will be within a, in the, uh, integration of services because you want it to be on the same workflow and as well to be adaptable as possible because it's so agile changing within the tools that it's like don't to get too attached to something just on a one sense because it might change tomorrow. Uh, and I would say that the third one would be the privacy because it's like you don't want to get into something that might get you troubles when you're trying to create new, new things. And there's been a lot of gas between when you're creating objects or if they are just references for somewhere else but whatever it comes into the solutions and it goes very deep within the things so just within that help those three elements might be the ones that can help you get like ai for the way you want it to work and as well on the way they can uh, bring you towards something greater right like to get more into the project yeah yeah precisely thank you enrique no. I actually really Probably. enjoyed this panel this discussion. Uh, very interesting. We missed Steve, of course. Um, yeah. yeah, I think really uh, he would have enjoyed to be here with us. Uh, so, yeah, um, I don't know, like food, uh, uh, thought for food, food for thought. Uh, do we, what do we tell the clients? Uh, we cannot make an excuse by saying, OK, our AI uh, assistants, they, they did the mistake or employees. Yeah referring to as okay well we have this ai chatbot you told us to use so it's not my mistake it's a very yeah. interesting aspect yeah i will say from that one it's like a matter of being created with that one technology is not a work not not going to work on itself it needs to get created it needs to get trained and as well it needs to be carry on right like it's just a baby at this point so <laughs> but they can, yeah. they can do a lot of mess everywhere so just need to take care of that one to happen thanks that was also a very good point. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you, Shut Up. He's also like, uh, yeah, writing. It was a good discussion. Thanks. Excellent. Love the panel as well. Thank you very much. You yes, too. Yes, thank you, Adriana, for hosting. Have a nice day. Yeah. It was nice meeting you. <laughs> nice yeah. meeting you Bye. as well. Thanks for connecting with all of you.